prelude to the first passage. Patriarchal society revolves around myths of processions. Earthly processions both generate and reflect the image of procession from and return to God the Father. According to Christian theology, there are processions within the Godhead, which is triune. The Son, who is the second person, is said to proceed from the Father, and the Holy Ghost is said to proceed from the Father and the Son. Moreover, all creatures proceed from this eternally processing God, who is their last end, with whom the righteous will be united in eternal bliss. Thus, in this symbol system, there is a circular pattern slash model for muted existence, separation from and return to the same immutable source. Christians, according to this tradition, participate in the, quote, supernatural processions through the sacrament of baptism. That is, they officially join the army of believers. Significantly, the word pagan is derived from the late Latin term paganus, meaning civilian. Quote, because the Christians reckoned themselves soldiers of Christ, end quote. The processions of Christians, then, are profoundly connected with military parades, mythically as well as historically. What is ultimately sought by this, quote, salvation army is reconciliation with the Father, for the human species has been alienated from him through the fault of the first parents, Adam and Eve, whose original sin has been transmitted to all. Thus, the mythic Christian procession toward God presupposes belief in possession by evil forces, release from which requires captivity by the church. Consequently, the sacrament of initiation, baptism, explicitly contains a rite of exorcism, blatantly belying the fact that this is really a rite of entrance into the state of possession. Western society is still possessed overtly and subliminally by Christian symbolism, and this state of possession has extended its influence over most of the planet. Its ultimate symbol of processions is the all-male trinity itself. Of obvious significance here is the fact that this is an image of the procession of a divine son from a divine father, no mother or daughter involved. In this symbol, the first person, the father, is the origin who thinks forth the second person, the son, the word, who is the perfect image of himself, who is, quote, co-eternal and, quote, co-substantial, that is, identical in essence. So total is their union that their, quote, mutual love is expressed by the procession, known as spiration, of a third person called the, quote, Holy Spirit, whose proper name is, quote, love. This naming of, quote, the three divine persons is a paradigmatic model for the pseudogeneric term person, excluding all female mythic presence, denying female reality in the cosmos. This triune of God is one act of eternal self-absorption slash self-love. The term person is derived from the Latin term persona, meaning actor's mask or character in a play. Quote, the processions of divine persons is the most sensational one-act play of the centuries, the original love story, performed by the supreme all-male cast. Here we have the epitome of male bonding, beyond the, quote, best, i.e., worst, dreams of Lionel Tiger. It is, quote, sublime, and therefore disguised, erotic male homosexual mythos, the perfect all-male marriage, the ideal all-male family, the best boys club, the model monastery, the supreme men's association, the mold for all varieties of male monogender mating. To the timid objections of Christian women, the classic answer has been, quote, you're included under the Holy Spirit, he's feminine. The point is, of course, that male made up femininity has nothing to do with women. Drag queens, whether divine or human, belong to the men's association. This mythic paradigm of the Trinity is the product of Christian culture, but it is expressive of all patriarchal patterning of society. Indeed, it is the most refined, explicit, and loaded expression of such patterning. Human males are eternally putting on the masks and playing the roles of the divine persons. The mundane processions of sons, 
have as their basic but unacknowledged and unattainable aim an attempted, quote, consubstantiality with the Father, the Cosmic Father, the Oedipidal Father, the Professional Godfather. The junior statesman dreams of becoming the president. The junior scholar dreams of becoming the professor. The acolyte fantasizes about becoming the priest. Spirated by all these relations is the asphyxiating atmosphere of male bonding. And, as Virginia Woolf saw, the death-oriented military processions display the real direction of the whole scenario, which is a funeral procession engulfing all life forms. God the Father requires total sacrifice slash destruction. Patriarchy is itself the prevailing religion of the entire planet, and its essential message is necrophilia. All of the so-called religions legitimating patriarchy are mere sects subsumed under its vast umbrella slash canopy. They are essentially similar, despite the variations. All, from Buddhism and Hinduism to Islam, Judaism, Christianity, to secular derivatives such as Freudianism, Hungianism, Marxism, and Maoism are infrastructures of the edifice of patriarchy. All are erected as parts of the male's shelter against enemy, and the symbolic message of all the sects of the religion which is patriarchy is this. Women are the dreaded enemy. Consequently, women are the objects of male terror, the projected personifications of, quote, the enemy the real objects under attack in all the wars of patriarchy. Women who are willing to make the journey of becoming must indeed recognize the fact of possession by the structures of evil and by the controllers and legitimators of these structures. But the solution is hardly, quote, rebirth, baptism, by the fathers in the name of male mating. Instead, this, quote, rebirth, whether it is accomplished by the officially acknowledged religious fathers or by the directors of derivative secular organizations, i.e. television, schools, publishers of children's books, is the very captivity from which we are trying to escape in order to find our own origins. Radical feminism is not reconciliation with the father. Rather, it is affirming our original birth, our original source, movement, surge of living, this finding of our original integrity is remembering ourselves. Athena remembers her mother, and consequently remembers herself. Radical feminism releases the inherent dynamic in the mother-daughter relationship toward friendship, which is strangled in the male-mastered system. Radical feminism means that mothers do not demand self-sacrifice of daughters, and that daughters do not demand this of their mothers as do sons in patriarchy. What both demand of each other is courageous moving, which is mythic in its depths, which is spell-breaking and myth-making process. The quote, sacrifice that is required is not mutilation by men, but the discipline needed for acting slash creating together on a planet which is under the reign of terror, the reign of the fathers and sons. Women moving in this way are in the tradition of great hags. Significantly, hags are commonly identified with harpies and furies. Harpies are mythic monsters represented as having the head of a woman and the body and claws of a vulture, and considered to be instruments of divine vengeance. As harpies, hags are workers of vengeance, not merely in the sense of revenge, which is only reactionary, but as asserting the primary energy of our being. The Furies were believed by the Greeks and the Romans to be avenging deities. As Harpies and Furies, feminists are agents for the goddess Nemesis. As Harpies and Furies, feminists in the tradition of great hags are beyond compromise. It is said that the goddess Demeter, after her daughter Kor, named Persephone after being abducted by Hades and brought to the underworld, was stolen from her, that she compromised. She had stated flatly that she would not allow the earth to bear fruit again unless her daughter was returned to her. But according to the patriarchal myth, when Zeus decided that Persephone should live with her husband, Hades, for three months of the year and pass the other nine months with her mother, Demeter set aside her anger and bade the soil be fertile. But Persephone had tasted of the pomegranate. She was possessed by her husband. 
and every year when the cold season arrived, she went to join him in the deep shadows. The myth expresses the essential tragedy of women after the patriarchal conquest. The male mythmakers presented an illusion of reunion between Demeter and Persephone Hor. The compromise can be seen as forced upon Demeter, but it was fatal for her to undervalue the power of her own position and set aside her anger, just as it was fatal that she taught the kings of the earth her divine science and initiated them into her divine ministries. The patriarchal Greek mythmakers, remakers, constructed a typical phallocentric plot when they, through Zeus, seduced her into the apparently satisfactory, even triumphant, compromise. However, the fact that the daughter was allowed to return, quote, for a period of time, says everything about patriarchy. Those who live in the tradition of the Furies refuse to be tricked into setting aside our anger at this primordial mutilation, which is the ontological separation of mother from daughter, of daughter from mother, of sister from sister. Women who choose hagocracy refuse to teach divine science to the kings of the earth, to initiate them into our mysteries. Hagocracy is the time slash space of those who maintain a growing creative fury at this primal injustice. A fury which is the struggle of daughters to find our source, our stolen original divinity. The history of the footbound women of China, which will be discussed at length in the second passage, provides us with a vivid and accurate image of the way in which women have been coerced into, quote, participating in the phallocentric processions. The foot-bound daughter was bound to repeat the same procedure of mutilation upon her own daughter and the daughter upon her daughter. To visualize the procession of generations of crippled mothers and daughters hobbling on three-inch-long caricatures of feet, moving slowly, grotesquely, painfully, in meaningless circles within the homes, prisons, of fathers and husbands, their owners, is to see the real state of women in patriarchy. To understand that this horror is still going on, assuming insidious forms of mind-binding and spirit-binding in every nation of this colonized planet, is to begin to comprehend the condition of women caught on the wheel of processions, clutched by the clockwork hands that circle the surface of the timekeeper's clocks. Furious women know that patriarchy is itself a continuous resurrection of the past, a series of processions. No social revolution, however, quote, radical, that falls short of metapatriarchal movement can break the circles of repetition. Only hags, that is, furious women, can kick off spirit bindings. This is possible, for mind slash spirit has a resiliency that feet, once destroyed, can never have again. The bindings can be burned. Virginia Woolf knew this. Quote, and let the daughters of educated men dance around the fire and heap armful upon armful of dead leaves upon the flames. And let their mothers lean from the upper windows and cry, let it blaze, let it blaze, for we have done with this education, end quote. Keeping the fire burning, saying no to processions, means facing something that is very hard to look at, deadly deception through male myth, the subject of the following chapters.